few more people show up. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Department of Medicine Education Conference. <clears throat> we have a visiting professor speaking today. Dr. James Marsh is the Nolan Professor and Chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. He's been both a basic and clinical investigator for many decades, actual years. And Dr. Marsh and I have been uh, close personal friends, both professionally and personally, for many years now. He's come from Little Rock to talk to us today about cardiac genomics, meeting choosing wisely, are we ready for precision medicine? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marsh. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Dracy. I'm, I'm pleased to be here, and I appreciate uh, people showing up. Um, there may have been a few of you who are watching some big guys chase around a football last night until fairly late. So go Buckeyes, I guess, is a... Uh, Um, and I'm going to talk with you about um, heart failure genomics from the point of view of a clinical cardiologist. I take care of patients part of the time. Um, I've cloned my share of genes, but I don't do, uh, I'm not training clinical genetics. But um, I, I guess the point I'm going to try to convince you of by the end of the hour is that understanding the role of genomics in medicine, and in this case in cardiovascular disease, can really move forward the quality and effectiveness of our, of our practice in a cost-effective way. So first case, we're going to talk about three cases. Here's the one we're going to start out with. This is 1922. It's a 40-year-old auto mechanic who develops a fever of 103 and a cough, and by day two feels ill and quite dyspneic. He sees his physician, who inquires about the cough and specifically the sputum. There is no blood in the sputum. The sputum started out white, but now has turned yellow when foul smelling. On exam, uh, there is dullness to percussion beneath the right scapula with decreased breath sounds in that area and coarse ronchi. The, the physician makes a diagnosis. The patient has a pulmonary infection, and it is probably not TB. Fair enough, 1922. ...the sputum microscopically and performs a gram stain. He does some further testing to make sure it's not TB, so he does an acid fast stain. And it's negative for the red snappers, for the acid fast. Diagnosis is now bacterial pneumonia with a gram positive bacterial organism. He has been practicing precision medicine. And of course, in 1922, almost always in the United States, it was a he. So he's made a rather precise diagnosis. But the therapy is the same for all pneumonias. Encourage oral fluids, encourage coughing and expectoration, apply a mustard plaster to the affected part of the chest. This is pre-antibiotics. The diagnosis is not TB, so the patient is not sent away to a sanitarium in the mountains for a year. That's important. And fortunately, the patient just felt miserable for a week and did recover and did not die. But the point is that the physician actually made a little more precise diagnosis, a little bit more precise, and he absolutely had to. And then there were, in the day, there was some nonspecific therapy as well. <clears throat> the dangers of influenza. 
stimulants is approved and recommended by medical men. An analytical test of black and white scotch whiskey has justified the recommendation. So if one has influenza, one can use a nonspecific remedy. Drink scotch until you feel better. So we'll fast forward about 95 years. And you go on the web, and this is out there, right? Ancestry DNA, family history is in our DNA. What's yours for $79? You can send off, you get a, a swab, you swab your buccal mucosa, you send it in. There's a, a little simple genomic testing that can tell you about your ancestry. Have any of you done that? I have. And it actually, it helps settle family ar arguments. I suspect in, in many families there are stories. Uncle Horace, where did he come from? Aunt Mamie, and so on. And so it turned out that some of my family stories were true, and some were not, but they were charming. Uh, but you can do this, you know, genomics is out there by, on the web, and you can do it yourself for bucks. So this is a case that was presented to me a few weeks ago by an intern at Morning Report. It's a 22-year-old black woman, a cashier. She presents with shortness of breath. She knows his orthopnea, fatigue, weight gain, leg swelling. She is two months postpartum, her first pregnancy. She's previously been healthy, albeit sedentary. I'm sure you admit folks like this or see them all the time. Short of breath, 22-year-old, what the heck. Um, she does not smoke, rarely uses alcohol, no recreational drug use ever. She thinks her father had some heart disease with leg swelling. Her father and mother were divorced. She'd seen him rarely. And her father died last year at the age of 44. Doesn't know too many details. She thinks that her deceased grandmother had leg swelling and maybe heart disease also. Hmm. Well, you know, we see lots of 22-year-olds who are short of breath. They're overweight, she's tired, she's just had a baby, what's the deal? So on exam, she is tachycardic, heart rate's 113, it's regular, respiratory rate's 18, blood pressure is 145 over 90, she's obese, I have no idea where her neck veins are, uh, she has bibasilar rals, she has distant heart tones, no murmurs, but she has a soft S4. She has edema to her knees bilaterally, so this is getting more concerning. Her skeletal muscle mass is normal, and she does not have drooping eyelids. Hmm. And here's her ECG. And I, I point out this really is, um, where's the date on this? Yeah, December 14th, something like that. What do you make of this? Sinus tack, axis is okay, no bundle branch blocks, intervals are okay. Lowish voltage, and rather poor our way progression, but I'd really be surprised it was an anterior infarct actually in a 22 year old. But it's a little bit of concerning as an electrocardiogram. And the thing that's actually most concerning about it is its sinus tack. That means she's sick. Oh my gosh. So she got a chest x-ray. This is a real 22-year-old who just came into the emergency room. And when you saw this, I think nobody doubts she and we are in big trouble. So there's marked cardiomegaly. My goodness, look at that. She's in pulmonary edema. She's got multi-chamber enlargement, LV, probably LA, probably RA. And she has a two-month-old baby at home. So, of course, we do an echocardiogram. <clears throat> the ejection fraction was estimated at 10%, which is barely consistent with life. 
There was severe diffuse hypokinesis. The LV was dilated. The Doppler parameters were consistent with restrictive pattern, indicative of left ventricular diastolic abnormal compliance or decreased or increased left atrial pressure. So it's grade three diastolic dysfunction. So there's some high filling pressures, maybe a diastolic problem, certainly a major systolic problem. Inferior vena cava was dilated, indicating right heart failure. Left atrium was mildly enlarged. Hmm. Big trouble. So, she has a family history, sort of. How good is the family history? This is our poor person's approach to genetics for heart disease. So, we know, all know about the Framingham Heart Study, following this population, this middle-sized, middle-class community in the middle of Massachusetts since 1950. And subjects were routinely asked about family history of heart disease or heart attacks. For a subset of this largely middle-class Caucasian population, they sent out a group of genetic counselors to track down and confirm family histories. And taking into account over-attribution and missed histories, the subjects got the family history right 26% of the time. What a great diagnostic test. My goodness. If we introduced the diagnostic test, some, something you'd run in the lab and you got it right 26% of the time, do you think that'd get approved for funding by Medicare? I mean, that's awful. And this is the best diagnostic test we have, family history. This is the 21st century. We've got to do better than that. So <clears throat> a little divertimento here, and we're going to talk about cardiomyopathies. And a little reminder, three main types, dilated, hypertrophic, and restrictive. And here's a, a, a diagram, or something like this, you probably all saw in your second year or first year of medical school. But it's a, I think it's a good reminder about just how they look. So recall four-chamber diagram of a, of a heart, left ventricle normally, free walls 10 millimeters thick, septum's 10 millimeters, 4 millimeters couple millimeters here and here. With a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, typically very thick in left ventricular wall, particularly the septum, might be 20 or 30 millimeters thick. Restrictive, thickened all over the place, not, not so localized. And dilated wall thickness is typically pretty normal or even thin. And the chamber is really dilated. So recall again, three types of cardiomyopathies. And here's just a, a, uh, a post-mortem specimen from a dilated cardiomyopathy. Here we can see the left ventricular chamber has become much more shaped like a soccer ball than a football. The right ventricle uh, is, is dilated. It's also thickened some. Here is the ICD wire uh, lead sticking out of there and the left atrium. So the, but the main feature here is that the LV is dilated and becomes spherical which also produces mechanical disadvantage for contracting strongly. Dr. Steve Levine, an old colleague of mine who's your head of cardiology here, has done some very nice work on the bad effects of the shape change in, in cardiomyopathy. So, 1972, Harrison's textbook of internal medicine. Mechanisms underlying dilated cardiomyopathy. We have ischemic, meaning too many heart attacks. And then we have idiopathic, leading the list, meaning we have no idea. And post-viral, post-chemotherapy, beriberi. Anybody seen a case of beriberi cardiomyopathy? We actually had a couple cases in the past year. We wrote them up. Yeah. Uh, alcohol, that happens some places. Advanced hypertension, other toxin, peripartum. Whatever the heck peripartum cardiomyopathy is. This is our patient's peripartum. So that's 1972. Well, we'll skip, skip forward to 2014. Here's the list from Harrison's. Ischemic, idiopathic, viral, post-chemotherapy, beriberi alcohol, advanced hypertension, other toxins, peripartum. We've added now, a lot of years later, collagen vascular disease, and familial. Not a whole lot has changed. Not a whole lot has changed 
mechanistically in our understanding, unfortunately. So, the clinical syndrome with dilated cardiomyopathies is heart failure reduced ejection fraction, FREF. I think probably most of you are familiar with the new acronym now. The prognosis is generally poor. 25% one-year mortality, 50% five-year mortality. Our 22-year-old lady has HEFREF. She is in a heap of trouble. It counts for 10,000 deaths per year in the United States. And at last count, Ebola, what, was two? This is a big public health issue, 10,000 deaths. In the African-American community, this is really a big deal. It's threefold increase incidence. How do you make the diagnosis? It has to be dilated. 117% of normal, normalized for body surface area. The ejection fraction has to be 45% or less in the absence of abnormal loading, meaning valvular heart disease or coronary disease. Exclude patients with real myocarditis, those who've had a cardiotoxic therapy. If somebody's had chemotherapy and just had a ton of adriamycin, doesn't count. <laughs> but you know what caused it, unfortunately. Familial dilated cardiomyopathy. One or more affected family members with dilated cardiomyopathy or sudden cardiac death at the age less than 35. So let's about our patient. Father, 44 years old, may have had a dilated cardiomyopathy, had probably had a heart failure. Grandmother had swollen ankles, who knows. So it turns out that 25 to 40 percent of idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy patients are determined to have familial cardiomyopathy when first degree relatives are screened clinically. History, physical, echocardiogram, chest x-ray. Most genetic dilated cardiomyopathies are autosomal dominant, a few are X-linked, and our sensitivity currently in 2014-15 of uh, genetic testing is about 25 percent. So we can actually make a precise diagnosis a lot more frequently, that, the, that pool of idiopathic is getting smaller. So to give you an idea of uh, how this plays out in a population, uh, there's a number of European centers that have been studying this rather extensively. So this is a report from the European Heart Journal a couple months ago. Uh, a cohort of 639 patients in Europe with dilated cardiomyopathy. About two-thirds were men. About half seemed to be sporadic. About half had a family history. The average ejection fraction was 31%. And I'm sure that as, as residents and faculty, all of us see people with ejection fractions of 31% all the time. This is not a, not a rare thing. So th this group in Europe then did some next generation sequencing and found uh, a high prevalence of uh, single gene defects in 12% carried at least two known gene mutations. And backing up for a moment, <clears throat> with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this is really pretty well defined now. And it, it's a disease of the sarcomeres. The vast majority have a single gene mutation in one of three or four genes that, that uh, encode uh, for sarcomeric proteins. With dilated cardiomyopathies, it's a lot, lot bigger field to put down. It's not just three or four genes, as we'll see. So these are the genes that are associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. For the residents, there'll be a quiz on this in 15 minutes. Make sure you memorize this right away. There's a lot of them up there. But there's, there's a few that, uh, you know, some of our favorite genes, our old buddies, calsequestrin, right, Desmond, Troponin, troponin T, can be a cause, mutation there. Um, actin, troponin I, 
potassium channel, sodium channel, a myosin heavy chain, ryanin receptor. Um, but the point is there's a lot of genes that are associated with and can cause dilated cardiomyopathies. It's not just two or three like there is for hypertrophic. Quite a few. And what's the phenotype of a disease-causing gene? Where, where's the problem? So it turns out um, the, the phenotype that occurs with these mutations, dilated cardiomyopathy, 16%. This is a syndrome that we probably see a lot of and we don't know we've seen a lot of it. We're starting to recognize, diagnose it better. And that's um, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. People with a cardiomyopathy of their right ventricle have a lot of ventricular tachycardia. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, Brigada, and so on. And where can it go wrong? If this is a heart cell, where can, where can things go wrong that produce a dilated cardiomyopathy? Well, there can be mutations in the nucleus. One of the hot areas is the cell membrane. Another is mutations in the sarcomere another at the Z disk, and another at the intercalated disk. The big four of, of target areas that can cause dilated cardiomyopathy, that syndrome, sarcomere, sarcomere's eye influx, cytoskeleton, intercalated disk. So I have to say that this, this field is still relatively immature, and there have not been a lot of uh, randomized, well-controlled clinical trials about what to do and how to make the right diagnosis. But that doesn't make people hesitate in, in making recommendations. So the, in making diagnoses here, the class one recommendations for genetic screening is for all cases of restrictive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVC. And where it pays off, it, it turns out, is dilated cardiomyopathies with cardiac conduction disease. Now, again, think about our patient. Did she have a conduction problem on her electrocardiogram? She actually did not. Her PR interval was OK. She didn't have a bundle branch block. So that's telling us that the yield and genetic testing for her is going to be a little bit lower. It's not out of the question, but that's not one right away that we'd say, ah, we can nail this. Maybe we can, but it's a little bit lower yield. So there, these are real people that are leading the way and moving this field ahead really rapidly. Um, Jonathan Seidman, PhD, and Christine Seidman, Cricket Seidman, MD, at Harvard Medical School in the in, uh, medicine and genetics department. It's a husband and wife team who have defined the genetics of these cardiomyopathies. I think you'll see them in Stockholm. I think they will get the Nobel Prize soon. They're, they're just doing wonderful work. They are also remarkably normal people. They're like regular. Bright as can be, but they're just regular people. So what do we do now with genetic testing? When do you get some uh, blood and, and spin it down, have the lab send it off for, for genetic testing? One can do whole exome sequencing at this point. But it gives us more information than we can really manage. Gene arrays, which are much more selective, gene arrays of maybe 50 genes for cardiomyopathies are available and relatively low cost. So gene arrays, at this point, is, is generally the way to go in trying to make a precision diagnosis for, for cardiomyopathies. So what's the strategy? Well, a couple of different centers, um, including Mayo Clinic and Brigham and Women's Hospital, a few others, have developed microwave, micro, not microwaves, microarrays with 47 proven or suspected genes that can lead to cardiomyopathy. So one can do high throughput screening with those. It just takes a couple hours to do the screen. And where there looks like there's a hit, it's followed with next generation sequencing. In 2011, the cost was about $1,800. The cost is coming down. Turnaround, turnaround time is about two weeks. By comparison, how many of you have ordered a CT scan in the past two weeks? 
probably most of us, right? So that costs about nine, a CT of the chest costs about $900 plus professional uh, fees, so maybe you know, $1,400, something like that. And a genetic screen costs probably around $1,400. Just to give you a sense of scale, the cost is not crazy. It's not cheap, it's more than a CBC, but it's comparable to things that we don't think too, or th too many times about uh, not doing. So where, what are the patients we need to think about for genetic testing? Who do you need to refer? People with conduction disease and a dilated cardiomyopathy. An elevated CK. This is easy. You draw a cretin kinase. That's a cheap test. If that's elevated, that really uh, makes one much more suspicious that, that there is a genetic cause of a cardiomyopathy. If there is similarly affected family members, in our patient, there probably was similarly affected family members. And it turns out a very high risk group is those, it's rare, but those with associated muscular dystrophies. For those of you that see pediatric patients, that's, that's something that pops up uh, more frequently. So I'm going to talk about some specific mutations. And honest to goodness, there will not be a quiz at the end of the hour about this. But just to point out that there's a few that are, that are high risk. And uh, we'll come to another case, and you'll see uh, how that actually may pertain. So there's one called an LMNA uh, mutation. That's a mutation in lamin. And lamin is actually a, a protein in the nuclear envelope. And I, have, I can't tell you why that causes a cardiomyopathy, but it does. And if a person has a lamin mutation, they're at particularly high risk for VT and sudden death. That's worth finding out. There is a, a uh, gene called RBM20. That's RNA binding motif 20. It controls splicing of titan. Titan is the biggest protein in our bodies. Titan actually acts as a spring in systole and diastole, um, where the, where the uh, uh, sarcomere is attached to the Z-band. If you have a person that has that mutation, there's fast progression of heart failure and ventricular arrhythmias. It's quite ominous. And then the Titan mutation, are, are, again, are common. 25% of dilated cardiomyopathy uh, genetic diagnoses in this population. Um, so that pops up a fair amount. And again, it turns out that in, in, in dilated cardiomyopathies, often it's, it's two hits. Not just one mutation, but a second one. And so somewhere between 5 and 12 percent of people with dilated cardiomyopathies have two or more pathogenic mutations. And this is unlike other, many other genetic diseases. You have one mutation, you get one disease. For this, often there's two hits. So it turns out just the terminology, if there's two mutations in the same gene, it's called a compound heterozygote, two mutations in different genes, like one in titan, one in troponin. It's a double heterozygote. And that may account for the variance in, uh, in phenotype. So even for the dilated cardiomyopathies, there are a few genes that are, are kind of uh, leading the hit parade here. Um, myosin heavy chain, titan. Um, there's a myosin binding protein. Here's LMNA. But uh, overall, you, there's quite a few that can contribute um, to it. Um, and looking back now about the other kinds of cardiomyopathies, again, we, I think many of us are more familiar with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. John and Cricket Seidman solved this about 20 years ago. When Dr. Dracy and I were going through our, our cardiology training, we thought that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was due to an abnorm abnormality of calcium handling in calcium channels. And I worked on that for about five years, and I was dead wrong. <laughs> that, was, that was a sideshow. This, this is where the real action is. And so there are some that are associated with the uh, uh, ARBC, the dilated cardiomyopathies, more than 25 genes. Um, Cardiac, cardiomyopathies with conduction defects. Here's lamin and a sodium channel. 
restrictive cardiomyopathies down here, troponin. And interestingly, infant sudden death, SIDS. It's a sodium channel mutation in at least 5% of the patients. So if we do genetic testing in 2015, so what? Well, there, there are three areas of potential impact. Making the right diagnosis, like the doctor in 1922 saying it's a gram-positive cox cocci that are causing the pneumonia. You can, make, you can determine prognosis, and we're beginning to see if it can determine specific therapy. And again, depending on the diagnosis that you make, it may or may not have a big impact. So for instance, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, depending on the gene involved, it can affect your, certainly your prognosis and probably therapy now. Dilated cardiomyopathy with conduction system disease uh, can uh, affect uh, prognosis and, and probably therapy and so on down the line. There's some areas where at this point it doesn't change our therapy very much. But let's think about prognosis now. So here's, here are mutations in Titan. These are cardiac events for Titan carriers. What is this telling us? If you're a man and you have the disease, you're going to do fine until you're 40. No effect on mortality. But then look out. You fall off a cliff. If you're a woman, you're going to do fine until you're 60. And that's where the cliff comes. Now, you can think about that if you want to know that. Suppose that in your family there was a strong history of sudden cardiac death. And you're 35 and a male or a female. Think about it. How about uh, this particular mutation? It, have any of you ever been to Iceland? It's not a common vacation spot, right? They have a, a very homogeneous population, and the genetics there are very wor well worked out. It turned out that 500 years ago, there was a founder gene mutation. And this is about the only cardiomyopathy that they have in Iceland. Uh, so this is like 80% of the cases is due to this one mutation. And from this we know that um, people do fine with this mutation. It's really quite benign until they're 60. And then they fall off the cliff. In rheumatology and cancer, we are now really thinking about specific disease-modifying therapy. If somebody has the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis when they're 24 years old, we try to put them on specific disease-modifying therapy before their joints are completely ravaged. Highly targeted. Can we do the same for cardiomyopathies? We shall see. So for instance, with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, depending on the mutation, we can tell somebody that has a milder phenotype. Um, there are clinical trials now going on for, for people early on in their teenage years and 20s who had the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, who were asymptomatic, just fine, and there's trials now of starting them on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or a calcium channel blocker early in life to see if you can modify the progression of their disease. Um, it's going to take a while to get that trial. This is a 10-year you know, kind of trial, but it, it, uh, it makes sense. As we mentioned, there are those who are high risk for sudden cardiac death, Lamin, Desmond mutations. One of the things we are learning is that selecting patients for an ICD implant should not just depend on ejection fraction. Somebody with an ejection fraction of 45%, but with a Lamin mutation, would probably be a good candidate for an ICD. Somebody with an ejection fraction of 
but had one of these other mutations that was a very favorable until they're 60, should probably not get an ICD when they're 25. So now what does an ICD cost? Anybody know? It's about $25,000 total device, hospital bills, doctor's bills. If you can put that off for 10 or 15 years, or maybe not at all, um, that's choosing wisely. So <clears throat> what's the genotyping strategy now? Start with a targeted gene panel, a microarray, micro array. and then sometimes one has to go to whole exome sequencing, but that should not be the starting point. Right now, we can draw blood from anybody in this room and for less than $2,000, sequence your entire exome, your entire genome, all the coding sequence. That'll cost $1,500. The analysis will cost another $9,000. And it'll give you more information than you want to know. So the uh, requires massive data analysis. And one has to deal with all the incidental findings. And we, honestly, we don't know how to do that very well. So for instance, right now, if somebody comes into your emergency room with a productive cough and a fever, you start with a chest x-ray, not a total body CT. If you got the total body CT, you're going to find stuff you don't want to know about. Right? That's where we are now with, with targeting microarrays for specific genes rather than sequencing everything uh, in a patient. We've also learned that there's some clinical factors that do not predict uh, mutations. So it turns out that gender does not predict race, black, white, Hispanic does not predict family history of dilated cardiomyopathy um, does not predict, and the ejection fraction does not predict. So that doesn't help us figure out who needs with, who comes into your clinic with a dilated cardiomyopathy? Who needs who needs to have the have the uh, microarray done? What's cost effective for genetic cascade screening? Um, it can be cost effective when compared to clinical and non-screening strategies. One result is actually more ICDs are implanted. Uh, overall in siblings and offsprings when we find high-risk mutations like lamin. Um, the alternative, of course, is, oh, uh, gee, Mrs. Jones, I know you're 25, you're just married, you've got a kid. I'm not sure if you're going to die of heart disease or not, so we're going to screen you every year or two. Come back for an echocardiogram, and we'll certainly do an echocardiogram every five years for the rest of your life. Sleep well. That's not without its cost either. So these are the guidelines from the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. I'm sorry, they're a little bit, a little bit small. For familial dilated cardiomyopathy, um, first degree relatives, the recommendation is serial echocardiograms. Um, three to five years is reasonable. Genetic testing may be considered in conjunction with con genetic counseling. For idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathies, screen first degree relatives. Utility of genetic testing is uncertain, but it's higher in patients with significant cardiac conduction disease and or family history of premature sudden cardiac death. So that's where we are now. I think those are getting a little bit out of date, and I think the, uh, the Heart Rhythm Society recommendations are a little bit more, uh, a little bit more current. I think you're all familiar with treating heart failure. All the interns and residents here are, uh, know all about uh, diuresing patients. These are the American Heart Association recommendations. Diuretics, class one, these are class one, of course, is the strongest recommendation. 2A is almost as strong, 2B a little bit less, and class three is harm. So we know that people need to be at, receive diuretics. They need to be on an ACE inhibitor. If they cannot, Tolerated NACE inhibitor, they should be on an angiotensin receptor blocker. Um, they should be on a beta blocker. Aldosterone antagonists should be used uh, selectively. People with class two and th two through four heart failure who have low ejection fraction. And that's all standard therapy. But that really hasn't changed much in 15 years. 
So what do we do in 2015? We do not have all the answers. The field's moving pretty rapidly, though. So there's actually a clinical trial of how to do this. It's called the MedSeq project. It's a randomized controlled trial of whole genome sequencing in clinical practice uh, and disease-specific genomic medicine for cardiomyopathies. And here, here's the, the broad outline here. Um, and what it's comparing is a general genomic medicine strategy, 8 to 12 primary care physicians, 100 total healthy patients, and they actually do whole genome sequencing on them and manage them as best they can with this overabundance of information. Here's disease-specific genomic medicine, 8 to 12 cardiologists, 100 total patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy and do more focused uh, genetic testing. And that trial is actually ongoing in Massachusetts. And we will see whether we actually improve care and improve outcome. That's ultimately what it's about. So recommendations now. So we can, genetic testing can uniquely complement standard clinical evaluations. It has exquisite diagnostic accuracy. We can do preclinical identification of affected family members. So we can do so-called predictive testing. And we can initiate testing in individuals with the most unequivocal clinical diagnosis. High-yield genetic testing. So these are, again, some of the take-home messages. Positive family history for an effective family member less than 30 years old, a family history of sudden cardiac death, and significant conduction disease on ECG. And again, your, your lab um, uh, can, this is a send-out test, but they, everybody, everybody's lab does send out tests. They can, this can be arranged. Having a, a access to genetic counseling either in person or via remote uh, counseling is important when you get the results back. There's areas of agreement and disagreement. Uh, generally, insurance companies will pay for tests <coughs> that uh, have satisfied the test of clinical utility. This is widely agreed. What, what constitutes clinical utility is not widely agreed. If there's direct implications for uh, management or prognostication, generally it's covered. And one of the nice things about it, genetic testing, it's once. You never have to do it again. So a lot of our patients have had more than one CT scan. But genetic testing, your genome doesn't change. You do it once. So the area of genetic testing for dilated cardiomyopathies is moving rapidly. We can make a precise diagnosis with increasing therapeutic and prognostic importance. Um, it is or soon will be cost effective. And clinical trials are very important to uh, understand the impact of, of diagnostic testing, dilated cardiomyopathy, or genetic testing in this setting. One of the obvious things where, for instance, one can perhaps save money is picking the right person, patients in, in whom to implant an ICD. It's not a totally benign device. Um, all of us have seen infections. All of us have seen ICDs that are going off inappropriately and driving the patients nuts. So picking the right patient for, for the implant, for instance, can be an area where we could really move ahead. So back to our patient, case two. 22-year-old woman with dilated cardiomyopathy, suspicion for heart failure in her father, a diet at age 44, a relatively high pretest probability for pathogenic gene mutation. One can make a precise diagnosis, and there certainly is implications for her two-month-old child. So uh, let me just go back to that. So, we are sending out a gene array on her. We don't have the results back yet. Um, there is this amorphous thing called postpartum cardiomyopathy, which is just means heart failure after being pregnant when we understand it really poorly. She may actually have congenital heart disease, right? 
and it just became manifest when she's postpartum. A dilated cardiomyopathy may have been her congenital heart disease. So we shall see. So I thought I was all set, had my slides all together for this lecture, and then something happened last week. There is a 45-year-old woman, a friend of an internal medicine faculty member. He is dating her, in fact. She is generally in good health. She ran a half a marathon last year. I met her at a holiday party on December 20th. Uh, right after Christmas, she collapsed at home with complete loss of consciousness. She had spontaneous recovery. She was urgently admitted to our hospital. She has an ejection fraction of 45%, a slightly dilated left ventricle, and she has runs of VT on her telemetry. She is an otherwise healthy person, no bad habits, no hint of coronary disease, low risk for coronary disease. Her sister has a dilated cardiomyopathy. She was worked up at Johns Hopkins. Her sister has a lamin A mutation. What should we do? My friend, the faculty member, spent uh, New Year's weekend sitting at her bedside. She's OK now. I saw her again at a party Saturday night. What should we do? She's a very smart lady, and she is scared, understandably. So the gene panel has been sent off. In the meantime, she is wearing a life vest, uh, an external automatic defibrillator. And if she comes back with a laminate mutation, she gets an ICD. And if she doesn't, then she'll probably get an EP study and further investigation, but she's going to probably be at lower risk. But if she has a laminate mutation, is having VT and collapses, um, she needs a device. So this is tough stuff. This is, these are high-risk diseases, these dilated cardiomyopathies. So our patients with genetic diseases, including a lot with dilated cardiomyopathies, um, make one think about the story of the Sword of Damocles hanging by one horse hair over his head. Um, it was very hard for him to sit still in that chair. And so making a, a clear diagnosis and maybe being able to make a, a, a key therapeutic intervention can be, of, can be of benefit. OK, I'll stop there and be happy to entertain questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the, the question is, how about, and all of us you know, see this in the newspaper every autumn, of the high school football player, Friday night out playing football, runs back a kickoff, just pushed out of bounds, not a major tackle, and drops dead. And it turns out that this person has, at autopsy, has a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we all feel dead, dreadful, and how could we have missed that? Um, it's a, it's a tough area, it's controversial. There are, at least to help me answer this question, fortunately, there was uh, guidelines updated by the American Heart Association two weeks ago about screening athletes. And um, it is not a recommendation do, to do an electrocardiogram on every kid who wants to play high school sports. If they have a high-risk history or a physical finding, such as a systolic ejection murmur that's louder than it ought to be in a healthy 16-year-old, then an electrocardiogram is recommended, and if there is something of concern there, then an echocardiogram. Um, and that's based on the best data available. Interestingly, in Italy, they do echocardiograms on everybody, man and woman, who, do, who does sports. 
it's yet to be established that that uh, really alters outcome or is cost effective. So the U.S. recommendation is history and physical. And, uh, you know, Johnny, you want to play football? Everybody in your family dropped dead by the time they're 25? Okay, let me get out my stethoscope here and we'll, we'll take a listen. Yes, sir. Yes. So, so that's a fair question. What is there? A, if you have the mutation, will you get the phenotype, or do you have the phenotype? Will you? So it's it's um, for the proband. They're usually tested because they have the phenotype, but then for the next generation, when you start doing the cascade testing, meaning just testing the next family member, do they have it? Next family member. Um, so you can, you can tell for almost certain if they have the mutation. The, the, the testing is very precise. Um, can you guarantee they will wind up with the same phenotype? No. And again, part of it is that the, the proband may have two mutations, and you'd have to see if this person has two mutations as well. But there still is some variation in phenotype, but one certainly can identify people who are at, at high risk. So it's, it's not an absolute guarantee that they will, the 22-year-old will develop dilated cardiomyopathy when they're 60. Um, but it's uh, pr pretty likely they'll develop some of the phenotype. Yes? So I guess the, the first question was first-generation testing. So if, if the proband has the mutation, then very likely if the person has any kind of insurance, including Medicaid, they will p pay for the testing of the next generation. Um, and then what do you do with that information? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it depends on, on the mutation. If they're, if they're a high-risk mutation for sudden cardiac death at an early age, that really advises you. If it's a mutation where everybody is fine until they're 60, I think this frequent follow-up is, uh, is, is quite reasonable. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really good and very sophisticated question. The interaction of environment in the gene is how the phenotype is produced in all of us. So for instance, suppose that somebody had a, a, a mutation for a dilated cardiomyopathy, not particularly high risk for sudden cardiac death, but they're going to start dilating their heart. Based on no clinical trials, my inclination would be to make sure that person has a really well-controlled blood pressure. We know that high afterload can help you know, produce dilated cardiomyopathy. So if they developed hypertension, man, I would control that to 120 over 75. Um, so that's, that's not, not based on clinical trials, but on just intuition. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>